Medical professionals of Reddit, what was a time where a patient ignored you and almost died because of it? I am a nurse and I had a very polite and lovely patient trying to remove all manner of chest tubes and IVs after a motorcycle accident. He was obviously delirious from the pain meds and the head injury but very nice still. I left him in the care of my co-worker for my lunch. 10 minutes into my lunch break I see him stagger past the break room door like something out of the walking dead. Trailing blood everywhere, only to collapse out cold a couple of seconds later. Said he needed the bathroom. IDK how the frick he pulled his own chest tubes out. Removing them always makes me cringe let alone doing it to himself. He was put back to bed. This time in the IQ. And got some more sedation and even though him ripping it all out set him back a couple of weeks he still discharged and came to say hi and thanks on the way out. The happiest delirious patient I ever had. What a bloody trooper. Haha. <laughs> had a post cardiac surgery patient get out of bed. Naked. And walk up to the front desk demanding to talk to the charge. Don't remember why. He unhooked his chest tubes from the suction. Surprisingly there was no bloody mess because he actually clamped them off. When asked about it later he said well I thought about pulling them out but it seemed like a bad idea. Had a throat cancer patient. We offered him surgery to remove the tumor. It was a fairly conservative surgery. He left because he didn't want a mutilating surgery and his daughter-in-law had been studying magnet therapy and she was quite good with it. His words. He came back a year later and was out of reach from any treatment. His cancer was so advanced that there was nothing we could do for him. Patient came in with syncope and general malaise. Found out she had a tiny patch of skin cancer on her ear, which she hadn't treated in over a year because she wanted to go to a different hospital to have it removed and just hadn't found the time. It metastasized to her brain, and I think other places. They gave her 5 months maximum. We had a college student come into the ear and had a wonderful case of appendicitis. He needed to get surgery ASAP as surgery is way easier and safer if done before it ruptures. He called his parents to let them know and they told him to refuse because he had a test upcoming in the week and they didn't want him to miss it. He left the ear against medical advice while we were all telling him that if your appendicitis gets worse and ruptures it can definitely lead to death. The kid luckily comes back about 10 hours later after it ruptured. He gets the emergency surgery and the amount of time he got to spend in the hospital probably doubled. Holy those parents are beyond stupid. Had a repeat patient, not quite frequent flyer status, as a medic that would always call for a severe allergic reaction to shellfish every other month or so. She had always had the allergy and knew her reactions were getting worse. After a year, six or seven calls of the silliness, my crew and I stayed in the hospital with her and talked at length about the situation since she'd always stay mum about how it kept happening. She told us she comes from a patriarchal culture and her father made this amazing seafood soup. If she didn't eat it and force her body not to reject his gift to the family she would lose her car, phone, or whatever punishment her father deemed necessary. We pleaded with her to do whatever it took to show him it was deadly and carry her EP pens with her. Fast forward a few years when I altered course into nursing and joined that uh, saw a familiar bloated face. Turns out she had gone off to college in another state and hadn't been home for a while, but had visited her folks for a holiday. Of course she had the soup and despite hitting herself with the EP pen when her throat started tightening, the reaction continued. Her mom, who I had never seen before, told me she tried to eat it fast and rushed to the bathroom where she was found on the floor. The medics couldn't tube her in the field so tried medical management until they could drive her to our uh, Doc performed a tracheotomy at the bedside and she went to the IQ. Took a week for her to recover and I was told by the IQ nurses that her father finally got it that her allergy was a real medical condition. Whoa, poor woman. Hopefully the father actually did get it because that is bulls. Shellfish allergies are severe. We had a mom in the Niku who would constantly kiss her premature baby on the mouth. Several nurses educated her around why that's not safe for the baby, and thankfully documented their teachings. This was during cold and flu season, and became even more concerning when the mother was coming in with cold-like symptoms, coughing, sneezing and obvious congestion. She still continued to kiss the baby right on the mouth. The baby was almost ready to go home by this time, but got extremely sick. The baby ended up on a ventilator and had quite the extended stay with many, many close calls. Animal hospital professional, 
At least once a week we have to raise suture up a spay because the owners don't want to keep the cone on their dog cat and let them tear up their surgical site. Their organs are right there. Keep the dang cone on. I don't care how sad Luna is with it on. Then they yell at me because it costs money to sedate and raise suture an animal. Pet owners are some of the worst in that way. Good owners are great, but those ones that buy an animal for the aesthetic are terrible. I've read that the most common reason for a surgery to be ray performed is the patient not following doctor's orders during recovery. Doctor says, don't ride your bicycle for 6 weeks. Patient hears, don't ride your bicycle until you feel you can. Patient came to see me having a stroke due to a blocked brain artery. I'd activated the code stroke team. Everyone was ready in the theater to get the clot out of her artery. Nurses, anesthetist, technician, bitchy, 42, insisted on updating her Facebook status and checking in before allowing me to treat her. Wasted 3 5 minutes and 6 10 million brain cells, if she had that many to start with. Winner of the WTF award from me. Didn't die, but did lose an eye as a result. Young kid, 20, with bad diabetic retinopathy from uncontrolled DM type 1, had eye surgery to remove blood and scar tissue from inside the eye. We told him to take it easy for a few weeks. He went to Six Flags. Roller coasters are bad. Retina completely detached. I got soft and painful. Had to be removed. I got soft. No. Please don't get up on your own. Then he gets up on own and pulls out line going into jugular that leads directly to the heart and proceeds to bleed all over everything until he pass out and almost dies. Again. No. New no, 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 no. One time at the VA after adult circumcision. Do not have sex or masturbate for 6 weeks. Decided to masturbate the next day. All stitches tore. When I was in medical school had a gentleman in his late 60s come in for chest pain. Found to have a large heart attack. Very impressive steamy and lad by EKG. Refused emergent cardiac catheterization go through the arteries and put a stent to open up the vessel of the heart. So he could bring his car home and planned on taking an ambulance back to the hospital. He was in the parking ramp and it cost $20 day to park. Came back by ambulance in full arrest. No pulse. And died. Doc had to call his son and explain what happened. He was like yeah that sounds like dad. He has always been cheap. Obviously what happened wasn't worth saving the $20, but that seems like really expensive parking. Friend told me a slightly overweight homeless woman was shooting in her butt and the spot was necrotic. She came in with sepsis and somehow standing and talking with what he could only describe to me as near full body organ failure. They stabilize her. Somehow she survives but is now missing half and butt. He said two years later she came back with her foot now rotting off from shooting in between her toes and on her ankle. Same condition. Etc. Just now the leg. They amputate and he says somehow she survives again. Except two weeks later she is pushed back in on a wheelchair. Drooling and nearly dead from overdose. Put an IQ. Son comes to visit her. At this point the hospital staff and my friend know her by name by the multiple visits. She hasn't seen her son in nearly a decade. He convinces her to promise to try to clean up for her grandchildren. Less than 24 hours later she ODs. Again, inside the hospital bathroom, somehow having snuck her kit in, nobody knows how. Friend said she was on the toilet with the needle in her arm. Still warm, but very very dead. Comma snuck her kit in, nobody knows how. Probably in that hollow spot where her butt used to be. That's what I'd do. Not necessarily the patient, but the caretakers at the facility where the patient was living. I used to visit different board and lodge facilities for adults with mental illnesses and meet with clients to discuss their mental health, help them set up job interviews, therapy sessions, and help them set up their medications for the week if they were unable to do it themselves. Most of these facilities were places for people who had left the hospital and were deemed independent and stable enough to have the freedom to come and go as they pleased in a shared living situation, much like a dorm. Despite having a place to stay and food provided, they were usually pretty poorly supervised by the mental health staff workers there. I often hated these places because, while they were ideal for some people who were truly getting back on their feet and thrived off being able to live a semi-normal independent life, they were way too lax for many of the sicker more isolating patients who were not at all well and slipping under the radar. 
Some of this included them not taking their medication as directed, which was one of the requirements for keeping their housing, but unfortunately it was not strictly enforced. There was one man who had paranoid schizophrenia who was extremely quiet and kept to himself. I had met with him a few times and he seemed to be going downhill in his appearance and general mood. I spoke with his doctor and urged the facility staff to closely monitor him and his medication intake. As I saw in his logs that he often skipped coming in to get his medication at all. I was told that they were going to be sitting down with him to remind him of his living agreement and that he had 30 days before losing his housing if he wasn't med compliant. I was also told that his psychiatrist was aware and they may be sending him back to the hospital that week. Apparently this never happened and he went out into the community and acquired a knife and used it to slice up his roommate while his roommate slept. He carved him from mouth to ear and stabbed him in the stomach several times. The man survived the attack but the man who had gone off his medication claimed he was being poisoned by his roommate through the window AC unit. For anyone with a violent incident like that on their medical report, it is incredibly unlikely he will ever be able to find a better rehabilitation house ever again that will accept him. The system basically screwed over two people that day, as the man who was hurt was already there for PTSD, and as you can imagine, it not only scarred him physically for life but exacerbated his illness with more trauma. That is terrible. Negligence created two victims and made them worse off. That is one of the worst stories on here. I doctor here. I had a patient who came in and on evaluation I determined that her diabetes was out of control by the look of her retinas which required immediate intervention. I sent her straight to the retina specialist who then scheduled her for an awe. She decided that day not to go in because she had work and couldn't afford to take off. She was cleaning houses and the sprays made her sneeze, causing massive hemorrhaging in her eyes due to the weakened vascular state from the diabetes. She went immediately blind and got into emergency surgery that day. It took months of recovery and injections to reverse some damage and she now years later has functional vision again. Her kidneys were also failing her and she had no idea. This kicked off a massive lifestyle change and a chain of doctor's appointments that saved her life. All starting from an eye exam. Patient was supposed to have starved for 8 hours for her morning scheduled breast surgery. During the procedure she regurgitated what can only be described as, as a full partially digested English breakfast, with identifiable sausages, egg, beans and possibly black pudding, up into her unprotected airway and attempted to inhale the lot. Managed to prevent the majority of it going down, but she needed HDU care for a day or so for her lungs to recover from the stomach acid. I used to work for a surgery center and the amount of morons who did this was astounding. There's a freaking reason you are told not to eat drink 8 hours prior to surgery. They have no idea about aspiration. When I'm told the 8 hour rule I fast for over 12 hours. I dang well make sure there is nothing in my system to frick me up. EMT paramedic student here. So we had a patient who was morbidly obese and couldn't get out of his house. He decides after about 4 days of uncontrolled chest pain to call it in. While well, we get there and find evidence of several MIs but refuses care and wants us to leave. About 45 minutes later we get a call from the building he lived in and we got there and it was him in full blown cardiac arrest. This man was so obese that we couldn't get him through the door and had to knock out a wall and lift him down off the second story with a lift. All the while me and my paramedic led were bagging him through an ET tube. Lots of firsts on that call first ET tube I put in and first IO is ever seen done in the field. Butthole patient on a centrimag. Basically a heart pump with hoses that draw blood from your heart into a pump next to the bed and brings the blood back to the heart through a different hose. As you could imagine, there is little room for movement since they could dislodge and you'd have blood squirting inside your body or outside. This guy was Adam and he had to sleep face down. Well he did, and then, he died. I would want the completely strapped down and anchored to the floor option. Him on dialysis and one of the nurses told me about patients that after kidney transplants just will stop taking their anti-rejection meds after a few years because they think they don't need it anymore and it's really frustrating for them nurses because the patients just ruined a donor kidney. My mother-in-law has been on dialysis for a while now, awaiting her new kidney. Problem with this is that she smoked about 9-10 cigarettes a day. Now she is only down to 4 cigarettes, 2 joints of weed and her vape. 
She is never getting her donor kidney and she will probably be dead in the next year. Only thing is that she makes all her dialysis appointments and takes all her meds religiously. I had the snip and my doctor told me to take a week off. Wear tight fitting underpants and not lift anything heavier than a cup of tea. I did exactly that and had no problems. My best mate thought that was all nonsense and went back to fitting kitchens the day after his vasectomy. And the day after that he was in hospital with a testicle the size of a coconut. Not a doctor. Have worked in addictions field. Too many clients have died or will die because despite the repeated warnings from their doctor that they have almost no liver function or that what they're drinking is giving them all sorts of brain damage they continue to drink hard. But a lot of these guys feel like they have nothing to live for but the bottle. It's really heartbreaking. This would be my father-in-law. At this point the alcohol is just slow working poison that is eating away at his body. Not a professional but a patient who got scared by their doctor. I had my second c-section. My surgeon had to leave before I could be discharged so the other surgeon have me my discharge orders. He'd just come back from having to re-sew a woman's abdomen back together because she decided to stand up and pick up a 5 year old the day she left the hospital. Well he let me know under no uncertain terms that I had better not pick up anything over 8 pounds or stand up while holding anything or we'd have words. Man he was scary but he'd also had to push this women's guts back in and see her terrified child covered in his mom's blood. So anyway I did not pick up anything heavier than my child for 2 weeks until they said I could. He also told me husband all about not having sex and he shouldn't even talk to me about it for 3 months. Sounds like a competent doctor. I'd follow that advice. Patient had vague abdominal symptoms and I recommended a CT scan. He refused cause he was afraid of radiation. He also refused colonoscopy so all we could do was an ultrasound, which found nothing cause he was fat and abdominal ultrasound is a crappy examination anyway. A year later he was admitted again, and this time he couldn't refuse a CT, where we found a massive colon cancer. He's probably dead now. My ex's dad refused to go to the doctor when he hadn't taken a crap for over two freaking weeks. When he eventually went they, shockingly, found a big old tumor obstructing his bowl. It turned out to be benign, but there was so much crap backed up in there the doctors said it was basically a miracle his colon didn't rupture and kill him with skeptic shock. Had a patient signed out by another doc at shift change pending chest x-ray. CXR showed aortic dissection. This guy should have been dead already. Being a small hospital, level 3 trauma center, in the middle of nowhere, we call the closest level 1 for a transfer. Ambulance shows up for transfer and the guy decides he's not going. He's got enemies in that city and they'll kill him. After a standoff in the hallway involving security, police, EMTs, multiple docs, nurses, and a very scared scribe, me, the guy, a very large man, gets on board with the plan and decides not to leave AMA. Later, we find out from EMTs he tried to jump out of the ambulance en route to the other hospital. Once he arrived, he left AMA. No clue what happened to him after but dang the dissection was insane. Sounds like you were the side character to someone's movie character. I wasn't there that day, but we had a patient who had been non-compliant with his leg pumps, these inflatable velcro things that force blood to continue circulating so that clots don't form in the legs. He didn't want to wear them, and he had the right to refuse, so we couldn't force him. Lo and behold, when therapy finally got him up to walk the halls, he immediately keeled over from a massive heart attack. They coded him right there on the floor, and got him back, but he passed later that night. I just can't comprehend this one. Those leg compressors are uncomfortable. I actually think they feel kinda like a leg massage. What an idiot. My dad tells a story of a morbidly obese woman who came into his clinic and after an exam told her simply, if you don't make drastic changes to your lifestyle and diet and start losing weight you are going to die. She was dead within the week. Her family tried to sue because my dad was clearly a witch doctor and cursed her to death. It was sad all around. This is an interesting cultural thing that we talked about when I was in nursing school. Some cultures like traditional Native Americans or Haitian cultures believe that if you tell them that they could die from their disease, then that's basically like you're wishing death upon that person. That sucks that your dad was accused of that. 
Once I was the only doctor on duty in a rural village with diminished medical supplies. The village is called Shanafir and lies in the desert southern Iraq. A 4 years old child came to what was supposed to be a with diarrhea and some dehydration. They didn't have tab water and they drink from a nearby river. Directly that is. From what I gathered it seemed that the child had cholera. Cholera has some unique reputation in medicine that I will skip here for the sake of your appetite. I strongly urged his father to keep him longer for observation but he refused. A few hours later he came back and the child was very ill and severely dehydrated. He was as we describe such case medically drowsy. He looked like a rotten wooden doll with the sunken eyes of an old man. I couldn't get an IV access, an accessible vein for fluids, and didn't have a central line set. I had to cannulate one of the large veins of his neck and he barely made it. Cholera wasn't endemic, not usually seen, there, so I had to make some calls and provide some samples to be tested about 200 miles away and send the child with an ambulance after he was stable. The father and his son came back a couple of weeks later to visit. I gave him some chlorine tablets and cookies for the kids. Awesome job man. I was assistant manager of a group home. We had a resident who had epilepsy and was also very reclusive. He would get agitated if we came in his room or even knocked on the door. However, policy said he had to be checked on every 30 minutes because of his seizure risk. That wasn't being done so I brought us up to the manager. She said she was aware but it was okay to bend the rules because he would get really upset when we checked in on him. I really wasn't comfortable with her answer but I was young and assumed she knew better than me. When I was on duty I checked on him every 30 minutes and he would yell at me, but I didn't let it bother me. About 6 months later, after I had been reassigned to another group home, he had a seizure alone in his room and was found dead. A day later, now I'm older and a little smarter. When I find a problem like this I stick with it and don't let people talk me out of it. Not again. Rest in peace. D. Gone but not forgotten. OMG. I'm currently a pediatric neuro nurse so 75% of my patients are kids with epilepsy. I wish more people would take seizures more seriously. I'm constantly trying to educate parents about the risks and so many of them are so nonchalant about the condition. I was working on a general med surg unit as a new nurse. An elderly diabetic patient ran over her second toe with the bedside table and the nail was ripped off. She was incredibly mean and didn't want anyone touching her or talking to her. I tried to explain the severity of her injury, especially because she was an uncontrolled diabetic and already had compromised circulation to her feet. She still refused to let me treat the wound. She also refused care from the physician. There was really nothing we could do more than a gentle cleansing with antibiotic ointment and sterile dressings which she eventually relented to. She was refusing everything and not demented or disoriented so we had to respect her wishes. She had overall poor hygiene and days later still refused more than just the bare minimum care. She came back to the hospital about 2 months later with an amputated leg. That toe was gangrenous and everything below the knee had to go. The doc told her she likely would have been fine if she didn't refuse treatment. After her amputation she again tried to refuse care. We did what we had to do and eventually she was discharged back to the nursing home she came from. She sabotaged her own healing several times by introducing infection to her wounds because of neglect and carelessness. I saw her obituary in the newspaper a few weeks later. Sounds like she was actively trying to die, but still in a passive way. Like a suicide you can claim to not be suicide. Nurse paramedic here. Frequently went to a patient's home for a shortness of breath call. She was always smoking while receiving supplemental oxygen, which is quite dangerous. I told her to stop doing it. A few weeks later, she burned her house down and nearly died of third degree facial burns after continuing to smoke while on oxygen. Had a patient who was NPO, not allowed to eat, because he had a bowel obstruction. He didn't like that we weren't feeding him. So, unbeknownst to the nurses, he called up Papa John's and ordered some garlic knots. He ate the entire box. Then, predictably, he vomited them up, aspirated his vomit, went into respiratory arrest, and coded. We did CPR and got him back. He had some underlying lung issues so we never could get him weaned off the ventilator. He spent a month in the ICU and was eventually discharged to a long term care facility with a tracheostomy on the vent. I'm not a medical professional, 
but I used to get allergy injections to build up my immune system because of the crazy amount of allergies I had. I would get these injections every week and I was instructed by my family doctor and the allergist to wait in the waiting room 30 minutes after the injection in case I received a reaction. Well, one day I decided I didn't want to wait anymore, also because it had been a few months without a reaction, and left immediately after my appointment. I went into anaphylactic shock not even 10 minutes later. It was crazy because I didn't even know what was happening at first and didn't even know how to use an EP pen. My wife is a labor and delivery nurse. When a baby is born they give it some vitamin that the baby can't produce itself for the first 6 months of its life, or something like that. I think it's vitamin K to help with blood clotting. It's potentially lethal if the baby doesn't get this obviously as they can bleed out internally. Welp. One mother didn't want their kid getting vitamin K cause anti-vaxxer. Baby ended up dying in the NICU. No way to know if the lack of vitamin K contributed to the death or not but, I think most medical professionals would point to it being part of the reason the baby died. It is vitamin K which is produced by gut bacteria. Babies have sterile guts until they start nursing feeding. If you are new to the channel, you can subscribe. I publish new videos every day. Until then, check another video. Bye for now.